Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Carrie Springer, and I'm an assistant curator at the Whitney and curator of the Whitney's presentation of Working Together, the Photographers of the Kamoinge Workshop. I'm speaking to you today from Manhattan, the ancestral homeland, Lenape Hoking of the Lenape. The name Manhattan comes from the word Manhattan, meaning island of many hills. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge the original inhabitants as well as the continued presence and vitality of indigenous peoples in New York City. I also want to mention that closed captioning uh, is available for the program this evening. If you would like to enable the caption, please do so at the bottom of your screen. I'm very happy to introduce tonight's program, the first in a series of four virtual programs that will explore the art produced by the photographers who joined the Kamoinge workshop in the formative years and consistently remain central to the group and its dialogue. As many of you know, the workshop was formed in 1963 in New York City, and the early members initially came together in a spirit of friendship and support. The artists had different backgrounds and experience with photography, but they shared a common purpose, to pursue photography as an art form and to make photographs of and for the Black community as they saw and experienced them in contrast with how they were often portrayed in art, media, and popular culture at that time. Kamoinge artist Louis Draper explained their perspective when he said, and I quote, we speak of our lives as only we can. The Whitney's public programs associated with the presentation of the Working Together exhibition will bring together members of the workshop with scholars, critics, and other artists to discuss their individual work as photographers, as well as the history and legacy of their collective efforts. Tonight's talk will explore the artist experience in Harlem in the 1960s and the Kamoige Workshop's connection to the Black Arts Movement. There will be three subsequent programs in this series. You can find a description and link to register for each of them on the Whitney's website at whitney.org in the events section. This series has been organized as a collaboration with the artists and in partnership with Aperture, a not-for-profit foundation that was founded in 1952 to provide a common ground for the advancement of photography. Through their magazine, publications, exhibitions, and public programs, they connect the photo community with inspiring photography and ideas. We're pleased to partner with Aperture on this series of panels on the occasion of Working Together exhibition and Aperture's release of a monograph on Kamoinge artist Ming Smith that was published with Documentary Arts. I want to extend a special thanks tonight to Brendan Emser and Emily Stewart at Aperture. I also want to acknowledge Dr. Sarah Eckhart for her great work in organizing Working Together exhibition for the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. Sarah has been a wonderful partner in our presentation at the Whitney. I also want to acknowledge and thank my Whitney colleagues, David Breslin, Martini Family Curator and Director of Curatorial Initiatives, and Mia Mathias, Curatorial Assistant, who worked close with, closely with me on the installation here in New York. And a very special thanks to Megan Hoyer, Director of Public Programs and Public Engagement, as well as Andrew Hawks, coordinator of public programs and public engagement for organizing tonight's event. For tonight's panel, Harlem and the Kamoinge Workshop, we're thrilled to have three amazing artists with us, Anthony Barboza, Daniel Dawson, and Sean Walker. They'll be joined in conversation with Tanisha Ford, 
who will introduce each of them more fully. Ford is a writer, cultural critic, and professor of history of history at the Graduate Center CUNY and a co-founder of Textures, a pop-up material culture lab that creates and curates content on black design, material life, and the built environment. She also co-edited with Deborah Willis the book Kwame Brothwaite, Black is Beautiful, that was published by Aperture in 2019. I'd like to turn the program over now to Tanisha Ford and welcome her, as well as the artists Anthony Barboza, Daniel Dawson, and Sean Walker. Thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you so much, Carrie, for that introduction. And thank you to you all for attending tonight's event. It's truly an honor and a pleasure to spend time with you all and with the artists of the Kamoinge Workshop to discuss their work within the context of Harlem. So I wanna give you a sense of what's gonna happen this evening. Um, I'll briefly introduce the panelists. We'll engage in a conversation and then we'll leave approximately 10 minutes for discussion and questions from the audience. To begin with the panelists' bios, I'd like to introduce Anthony Barboza. Barboza was born in New Bedford, Massachusetts and came to New York City as a teenager. He joined the Kamoinge Workshop in 1963 when he was 19 years old. He's a photographer and historian as well as an artist, painter, and writer whose career in the commercial arts began over 40 years ago. Barbosa's special fondness for jazz music and musicians is reflected in a large portion of his work done both professionally and artistically between the late 1970s and the late 1980s. His many interests were captured in his book, Black Borders, published in 1980 with a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts. And in 1982, he had a solo exhibition, Introspect, the photography of Anthony Barboza at the Studio Museum in Harlem, co-curated by Deborah Willis and Danny Dawson. Through his work, Barboza continues to promote and preserve the memory of African-American photographers and artists. Daniel Dawson has worked as a photographer, filmmaker, curator, arts administrator, and consultant he served as curator of photography, film, and video at the Studio Museum in Harlem, director of special projects at the Caribbean Cultural Center in New York City, and curatorial consultant and director of, the edu of education at the Museum of African Art, also in New York City. As a photographer, he has shown his work in more than 30 exhibitions. He has also curated more than 40 exhibitions, including Harlem Heyday, the photographs of James Vanderzee and The Sound I Saw, the jazz photographs of Roy de Caraba. Dawson currently teaches at Columbia University in the African American and African Diaspora Studies departments and continues to photograph in Harlem. Lastly, but certainly not least, we have Harlem native, born and raised, Sean Walker, who is a founding member of, of the Kamoinge Workshop. A professional photographer for more than 50 years, Walker has traveled extensively and has exhibited, lectured, and been published throughout the world. He is a photographic artist and a master black and white printer. His work is included in the permanent collections of the Museum of Modern Art, the Schomburg Center, the Brooklyn Museum, the National Gallery of Art, and the Studio Museum in Harlem, among many others. In 2020, Walker's archive, including his extensive collection related to the Kamoinge workshop, was acquired by the Library of Congress. Walker is also an educator and he has taught in the City University of New York system and at the U International Center for Photography. He continues to photograph in and around Harlem. Harlem, this space that I now call home but long before I did, it was a space that existed for me in a way both real and imagined. 
Imagining that it was a space that was steeped in the mythography about the literary, musical, artistic, and intellectual giants who walked the wide boulevard streets and avenues of this enclave in upper Manhattan. But it was real in the way that everyday people also walked those streets. These were people who had families, who've made homes here, built New York City's economy, have experienced race riots and police violence and gentrification. These are also the same people who've innovated with fashion and other raw materials, fostering black joy, black love, and a sense of community. Many people see Harlem as a major nodal point in the larger black diasporic world. And so it makes sense that you see photographs, not only of the three panelists whom I've introduced today, this evening, but also other members of the workshop whose photographs have centered on this space, this space with so much rich history of our people, of our struggles, of our joy, of our pleasure, of our artistic production. So again, it is my honor to be in conversation with these three members to discuss not only the exhibition, but also their practice and how shooting in Harlem and forming the workshop in the space of Harlem helped to create a community that flourished and continues to flourish today. So without further ado, I will ask my co-panelists to join me and we will begin our, our discussion. So my first question here is one that I'd like to pose to all of the panelists. And that is, can you tell us a little bit about Kamoenge's core mission and why Harlem was such fertile ground for the workshop? I'd be particularly interested in hearing from you first, Sean, since you're a founding member. Sean, we need you to unmute. Sorry, this is Megan. You're on mute. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, as I was saying, I was born and raised here. So Harlem was like the center of the universe for me. You know, uh, fortunately, my mother was sort of like wanted to be an, an uh, entertainer. And so she exposed us to a lot of culture in all. And living um, shortly, not far from 125th Street, which really was where everybody went. If you just wanted to see entertainers or boxers or anybody that was known in Harlem, that's where you went to take a, you can get a look at. Them. So for me, uh, I think when we got into the workshop, I think most of the fellows lived in Harlem. That's the other thing, Lil Draper lived in Harlem. Uh, Herb Randall, Danny, I remember seeing Danny back in the 50s, late 50s, early 60s. Uh, so we all kind of came together in a community. And we all had, by the, the late 60s, we had developed a sense of ourselves in the political and social and cultural things that we had a problem with that was happening in Harlem. So I think that's what started it. And I think that's what drew everybody together because we all felt the same thing about this community. You know, and if they didn't, if it wasn't Harlem, their particular community, they came from communities that were similar to Harlem. There was any black community you go to, there's a Harlem, there's 125th Street. You know, so I think that's what made the group solidify really easily because we, we thought about the same thing and wanted to make the same changes and expose the ills and evils that were happening in the community. How's that? 
That's that's wonderful. And I love that <laughs> what you said about there's a 125th Street everywhere. Um, what about you, Danny? Anthony, either of you have thoughts about the core mission of the group and why Harlem? Um, I never lived in Harlem, but Harlem was always on my mind. Uh -huh. um, in other words, uh, Harlem is just a state of mind. Um, <clears throat> when I got into the group, I come from out of town. Uh, and I was 19. Um, my first impression was that um, I had finally found older brothers because I had seven younger brothers. So I learned a lot and sucked in a lot, but just by being with the group. And when I first got with the group, I didn't even have a camera. Um, but what I remember most about it was that um, everyone put up work and some people really cut it down a lot. <laughs> uh, and some people said, I like it or I don't like it. But I always felt that when I heard someone say more about a particular image, it just sucked into me that there was more than meets the eye. Um, and I learned from that and I got a camera a little $20 camera made in Hong Kong. <clears throat> but the thing was that I finally found something that I really had passion for. And it was primarily not just the camera. It was all the brothers there um, sharing information with each other and really uh, giving what they felt strongly about and expressing it. That was the most important part to me. Uh, since I was so young at that time, it, it was just amazing to me. Just to sit there and listen. Um, later on, <clears throat> I could talk about work, but in the beginning, I saw some people go out of there crying that were guests that came in and their work was cut down. Uh, and that's no joke. To see how um, some people couldn't stomach it being criticized. And the best way to learn to me is to be criticized in an honest opinion um, instead of I like it or I don't like it. You really learn a lot more when you are criticized about something that you're beginning to do. Okay. Yes, and, and to that point, I mean, you you have famously said that um, the Kamoenge Collective was was like your college experience, right? Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, because I couldn't get into college. <laughs> I had bad marks. No, I wasn't doing anything, but I did read books. But um, it just wasn't my time. When I sat there with the group, I knew it was my time in my beginning. It's just something you feel. Um, you can't always decide what you're going to do until the time comes. And for me, that was the time. I finally knew what I was going to do. And it was because of the group. That was the most important thing. I finally found something that I can do, that I wanted to do. And the energy of the members and the enthusiastic about each image was so beautiful. Uh, that it's hard to describe. It was really that important to me. It just hit me. Yeah. So here I am, almost 60 years later. Uh, same passion, same problems, <laughs> but I know what I'm doing, that's all. 
and we love to see it. So Danny, I, I'd love to hear your take on this too, about not only the, the group's core mission and why Harlem, but also to, to kind of piggyback on something that Anthony said about the nature of these workshops. I have heard that they were kind of famously rigorous, that <laughs> you, know, you all weren't just about patting one another on the back, but it was really about being a training ground for artists. Can you, can you speak to that? About well, you, can, you, can, you, can, you can call them rigorous, but they could also be called severe. You know, so they're, they're, they're in, incredibly intense. You know, and, and, and like Sean and Tony said, that like Harlem is a kind of consciousness, a state of mind, because I didn't grow up in Harlem either, but I grew up close enough to be able to come to Harlem all the time. And I did. I came to Harlem all the time. I was there, I was there almost every weekend. I came over very early in the 60s and photographed um, uh, Malcolm X. But I remember too, um, I worked at the Black Arts with Amiri Baraka, which was on 130th Street. You know, we, were, we were there doing work. I was the curator for the, the, for the um, Black Arts. And only talking to Sean recently did I realize that I had met all the Camoño members earlier because I had curated a show at the Black Arts. And then Sean said, I was in that show. And then he named the other people in the show. But I didn't know them at the time. But they were the, they were Camoño members. This is 1965. Then later on, I met Lou Draper, um, became very close in film school in 1968. And then Lou invited me to join the group around 1970. I'm not quite sure when I was inducted into the group, but it was 1970 that I came into the group. But it was funny that when I found out from Sean that I've already met the group. I, did, I didn't know it, I didn't realize it. Even after I joined the group, I didn't realize that I'd met the people before and used their work before. But it's, it was so incredible too to come in because in one sense, I was very formally trained in photography. I was trained by my father when I was a kid and I studied at the Newark School of Fine and Industrial Arts and I studied at Columbia and I studied at um, the New School with Lisette Modell and then at, at NYU with Lou Draper. Lou and I studied with um, um, Paul Caponegro and also with John Sarkowski and Peter Bunnell. But, but it, it, it's um, interesting though because my real training and my real teaching came from Kamongi. I had you know this uh, standard kind of academic background in that, but the way we really learned about the intensity of being an artist and caring about art came in Kamongi. It came in the meetings of Kamongi. And though they talked about the in, insistent on quality work, that you couldn't bring in work that weren't, if your work wasn't spotted right, people would say, take that work away and bring it back when you spot it. You know, don't show that work when it's not prepared, but you finally get a sense of there's a real, um, uh, standard, a high standard you had to obtain, just not just photographically, but in how you presented your work and how the work was matted or printed, you know, and how, how it was spotted. The work had to be perfect. And, but that's also a thing that you don't realize consciously that you're being um, uh, taught standards that you have to have for the rest of your life. You know, when you view other photographs too, it, it makes a real difference in that. So you, like you said, you've had a lot of formal training in photography, mm -hmm. but a lot of people, particularly people of African descent in this country did not have access to that kind of formal training at that point in time. So can you speak a little bit about the importance of not just Kamwenge, but also other artistic right. communities and, and collectives for emerging black artists? But I think in one sense, um, well, Harlem, as, as, as Tony said, Harlem is everywhere, but I don't think formal training is important, mm -hmm. you know? Because there's a point where you have to know your craft, and that's just a kind of respect for the craft, for the field that you're in. But the training, you, you can come the way, way most Kamonga members came, by doing the work and by critiquing it. And we're also, we're living on the planet, and we have to be actively, um, active intellectually, looking at other work, studying other work, taking the work seriously. And that was one thing Lou and everybody else in the group did. You demanded to go to museums, you demanded to go to shows, you demanded to, and so any, mm -hmm. any current show that was great, you had to go see and you had to talk about it. So no matter what art it was, what, whether it's a, a Tutankhamun exhibit, whether it's a, a photographic show, of Eugene Smith or something, you had to go see it or you weren't responsible as an artist. You weren't, weren't taking your education. But what's really more funny about that too, is that the real standard for us wasn't, wasn't just visual arts. The standard for most of the members of this group was musical arts. It was, it was, the, um, it was jazz, in fact. Our real models was Miles Davis, John Coltrane, Thelonious Monk, Duke Ellington. So the people that really inspired us, you know, we love you know, Thank you, Ali. <laughs> hey, you were showing, I got to do a program for Jackie's son on the 21st. Yeah. For, for Renee. Yeah. But it's, okay. it's, it's, it's really funny though, because when we think about that, our standards were set by them and as, as Albert Murray taught us, there's no higher standard of artistic production on the planet than those people. Duke Ellington, there's no one better than Duke Ellington in any field of creation. 
you know, Duke or Miles or Monk or John Coltrane. There's nobody better. And that's our standard also. So we've been, and you can see there's a, even like this piece, right? This piece is musical, whether it's about musicians or not. And the Sean's piece with the two hats, the two white hats, it looks like an Easter parade or a world parade. Those are musical pieces, even though the, 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 the um, ostensibly don't represent music, you know, but there's the musical sensibility in all the work that you see. And that, that's, that's another model of Camorgan. So even though we're talking about photography, photography, of course, was there. And you had to learn photography. And you had to learn the craft and the history of photography. But you also had a sensibility that was bigger than just the craft of photography. Your sensibility was also musical. And that made everything we did sing in another way. I love that. This is the concept that we are our own teachers, that we have our own epistemologies, our own ways of knowing, um, our own systems of evaluation, our own Thank aesthetic you. politics. And I also love you talk, hearing you talk about the musicality of the photography and the, the connections between music and photography. What about you, um, Anthony or, or Sean? What are your thoughts about this connection or relationship between your photography? <coughs> and well, the, the first thing is that of all the art forms, music is the highest art form. Okay, uh -oh. Uh -oh. why is it the highest art form? <laughs> I don't care if you disagree with me, Danny, or not. <laughs> it's the highest art form because music goes so far back before anything else came about. Maybe painting did at that time, but it does vibrate the bones and makes you move. And you carry that through ancestor after ancestor so that even when you move walking down the street, it's a certain rhythm. And for us, it's always been about rhythm. And that's music to us. So when we are even photographing, we are moving with a certain rhythm. And with that rhythm, we're capturing the rhythm of our own people in a certain way. That's why even when they had a discussion with some talk show in James Baldwin, and the guy said that, oh, literature is the highest art form. And Baldwin kept saying, no, it's music. Because it comes from generation after generation through our ancestors. And it really embodies in our body when we carry on each day. So it's always been that to me. What do you think, Sean? Well, I want to tell you a little biography of me and music. I think uh, 13 years old, I was in the hospital and I was the only person that had a radio, young. And one of the older guys said, listen, uh, I want to listen to your radio. And we had to stay up after hours, around 11 or 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock. Uh, Charlie Parker was doing a live broadcast from Birdland. Now this is in the 50s. First thing, first time I heard Charlie Parker, heard of Charlie Parker, who is this guy? Sometimes even younger than that, um, Pops and some friends were in the house drinking and they left the booze and went out. And I decided, well, this is time for me to take a drink, taste this stuff that every, all these adults are drinking. Got loaded. And all of a sudden, now my mother's half scared to death. Well, didn't take me to the hospital. What's going on? My uncle come before the beating and said, take him out of here before I kill him. He takes me to the Apollo to see Charlie Parker and Strings. Mm. Mm. Now, again, in the 50s, I started going to Birdland in 1957. So I'm saying that to say, so when I run into these guys from Kamange, we used to play, somebody would come in and play a brand new al album and put it on and say, who's that playing? If you knew who the lead person was, then who all the side men that were playing? Right. You understand? So now this is what we did out of meetings. So I'm trying, trying to tell you how much of a part of mu music, I mean, the meetings that music was. That all of us are just born hanging out in clubs. So I, I grew up around another part. I grew up around the corner from Mitten's Playhouse, down the block fairly from Someone's Paradise, 
and all the other local clubs in Harlem. So I'm 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 a jazz person at 17, 18 years old. Mm. So John, the, John, you grew up on 118th Street. I grew up on 117th Street, the same block you used to live on, yeah. man. You used yeah. to live between Lenox and Fifth. Here's another one. Danny Dawson lived somewhere across the street from Art Blakey, right? So at some oh. point, the first Bentley I saw was, um, what is this, the lady used to come the through? Ma the, yeah. the, the, Baron, the Baroness. The Baron. So the first Bentley I saw, I said, oh, I said, I want one of those. Didn't know what Bentley was, but this looked different from any other car I'd ever seen at that time. <laughs> so that, that whole music thing was, I said music is the background, mu jazz is the background music to my life. That's what I can say. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so two things here. One, jazz is, is a background of my life in an interesting way, too. And that's largely because my father loved jazz. And my, my dad was born in, in the early 50s. And so I grew up in a home where jazz was constantly playing. And even when I go visit my dad, well, when we're not in a pandemic and I go visit my dad, there's always jazz playing in his house. And he's always fine tuning his equipment to make that music just pop. And that music even today becomes a background for me as I write, as I write histories of Harlem. Another thing I hear you say here too, um, the three of you, is that you're doing this kind of mapping of Harlem, right? what Harlem looked like when you all were roaming these streets as younger men, right? You know, what, what were the spaces that you frequented? So that's also got me thinking about um, what it's like to photograph Harlem. So when people think of Harlem, they immediately think of 125th Street, the main thoroughfare. But I'm curious, how might Harlem look different spatially if we experience it through your photographer lens? In other words, what were some of your favorite places to shoot in Harlem and how did you navigate the uptown neighborhood? I think for me, I started at 125th Street and 7th Avenue, period. And then, you know, if it wasn't happening there, you go to 5th Avenue or maybe you go to 8th Avenue. But for whatever reason, oh, you know why? Because Michelle's bookstore was there too. So right around the corner, you know, on 125th Street, there was Michelle's bookstore, the Poke Chop. Somebody had, Buford Smith had a picture of Poke Chop on a soapbox. So these guys were talking about back to Africa movement, stuff like that, politics, black politics. So that was another made it that 125th Street and 7th Avenue was a place to be, to go to shoot. But there were so many times that I would put four or five rolls of film in my pocket to go to 125th Street and never get off my block. So that was another thing. So 125th Street, it was Harlem itself. But if you didn't want to just roam the neighborhood, and I have to say too, it was really interesting because I shot as much in, in Spanish Harlem and even in the Italian neighborhoods. I went over there that I felt comfortable enough about going to these neighborhoods back in the 50s and 60s that I didn't have to worry about being beat up because um, the, the times were very close about their community. And would, you know, kind of ask you, what were you doing here? So, but it was laid back enough that if you were walking and not hanging, you just walk on through. So, so for me, and again, it was the community that if you look at some of my photographs, I have to think of, scratch my head and try to figure out where did I take this at? You know, I know it wasn't the normal places that I went, but you were free and that's important. You were free to go into all these neighborhoods that you didn't go into and didn't know a person on the block. That was important. <clears throat> you know, go ahead, what's that mind? Okay, with me, um... In 63, when I first was with the group, um, <clears throat> I didn't really go to Harlem. I mean, to me, Harlem is any black person walking the streets anywhere, so, um, you already pick up the rhythm of them walking. Yeah. Okay, so I had to, was drafted in the Navy and I wanted in my spare time 
to photograph. And it was just like Harlem, I guess. I was free to go anywhere where we were. And I had no problems pointing my camera. And <clears throat> it was just like the first time I went to Africa the same way. I walked there and it's like, this is Harlem. Yeah. Everywhere you go, this is Harlem. Why, I only see us. And that was so beautiful just to see us and feel comfortable. The only thing I noticed when I was in Africa is that one day in the market, this whole crowd of people were chasing and stoning this boy down the street because he had stole something and they were protecting their neighborhood. And that was the most shocking thing otherwise I mean, even one time when I was in Africa for the first time, I left, my assistant left the camera in the little canoe and no, but we ran back to get it. Nobody stole it. <laughs> Nobody stole it. Everywhere was like, welcome. Yeah. Yeah, it was just amazing to me. And it had that same flavor everywhere I went in Africa. The rhythm of us on the street, even talking. You know, like they say, the Italians talk with their hands. Well, we talk with our bodies. That's what I always felt. So Harlem was everywhere to me yeah. because I didn't have to go to Harlem to photograph us. We were everywhere trying to do something. Okay. Yeah, I'm yeah, done. I, I just no, want to say, to yeah, I wanted to say a quick thing, Danny, just to answer. I remember an experience I had in the 1970s up in the Bronx, taking some acid, some LSD. Was supposed to be out hanging out, looking at the world, and it was raining, and I had to go back home, put on the music, and was blasting, and I looked out in the window. So now this is a half white community, half black community. And that was the first time I really visually saw black people's rhythm. I could see that white folks walked at a different pace to that jazz and that music. And black folks mm -hmm. were always on step. They were always in the rhythm. And that kind of mm -hmm. so profound to me that I always carried that for the rest of my career. I'm sorry, Danny, I just wanted to say that. No, no, I had, yeah. a, fun, I had a funny story like that. Not, not, not the same thing, but it's when we came with the Black Arts to um, Harlem and we were on the 130th Street and we had this idea, it was a Mary coming from the Lower East Side, me coming from Newark and um, talking about we were bringing culture to Harlem. And then we, you know, I know, that, that, kind of ignorance of, that, that combination, of, combination of ignorance and arrogance was incredible. But, but one, one day we're standing in, the, in front of the Black Arts with a Mary and Ilambe and Kwame walked up. This Ilambe Brath and Kwame Brathway, who, who, who um, Aperture just did a monograph of. Well, they walked up, then we started discussing him. So he said, oh, well, you came here and you're bringing culture to Harlem in uh, 1965. He said, we started in 1959. Yeah, you know, so we've been doing that. <laughs> then it don't, but but dig this, we're sixty five. Come on, get sixty three, and before that's where you see. And so you you there all this trend, and, and it goes all the way back to the Harlem Renaissance. It goes all the way back to Marcus Garvey being conscious of black of black locale, having an aesthetic, having a culture. You know, so just the kind of arrogance we had coming in, thinking we were bringing something to Harlem. As opposed, to, as opposed to contributing to Harlem. No, but we were, we, were, we were quickly corrected, though, by the people in Harlem who did have that aesthetic, you know, so, oh, no. Yeah, I like that you brought up, that you mentioned Kwame and Ilambe's names in this space, you know, because right. I, of course, as you all know, I, I worked on the Kwame Brathwaite book with Aperture and with Deb Willis, and I, I love the Brathwaite and the Brath families, and uh, I was wondering if there was any overlap between these two groups or what that relationship was so I'm, I'm glad that that you mentioned yeah, but, it. but it's so funny because the, the um their, their group was a jazz you know which was a, was based on african culture and jazz and and art you know so they, they the same combination we thought we were bringing they had already done almost a decade earlier than we had you know but it's, it's really funny we talk about a continuum because at the black arts i met most of the uh, kimonia photographers 
one of the people who frequented was Ed Spriggs. Then Ed Spriggs goes on to run the, the studio museum. He's the one who takes it from being a studio project into making it a museum. So there's a direct connection between the kind of black arts movement, the pioneer movement that Olambe and, and um, Kwame come out of, and that turning into the black arts, that turning into the studio museum, that turning into other kind of more standard um, arts institutions in, in, in Harlem. But it's, the, the consciousness was the consciousness of Harlem. It wasn't something we were bringing in. It was always there, you know, so. Yeah. Yeah, always. I think that it was something important too that I mentioned earlier was the funding. That the, the government at funding, all the Haru acts and the black arts and summer in the city and all the programs, because you worked with summer in the city for a while, didn't you, Danny? Yeah, but that, that, the Haru act was what funded the black arts programs. Yeah, I know. But they, they, and this is what, I come out of 117th Street, I'm working as a stock clerk in a grocery store. I go from that, I asked Ray Francis, I said, man, I need a job. Ray turns me on to this woman that works up in the, the uh, what is it, Teresa Hotel, where are you acting? Well, tell, tell, him where, tell him where Ray was working. <laughs> oh, he was working in the record store. Oh, I forgot That's about what that. I he, mean, that's what I mean. He was working you know. in the record store. So... I go up there to ask this woman for a job. Now, again, I'm only training I have is Komoinge. So I had high school training in Komoinge. So this woman said, she looked at my portfolio and she said, well, do you want to run the program up there? Uh, then this was a, a weekly newspaper that they hire you out to had. And I said, no, no, cause you know, I'm taking this job and I don't know that much about photography, so I'm not, I just want to get a job. And I think at, back in the 1963, four, five, they were paying $125 a week. So we went back and forth. I told the woman, no, because I didn't want to embarrass my friend. I didn't want to embarrass Kamoenge taking this job. And then somebody saying, well, who's that clown you all sent up here that he don't know nothing? I get upstairs and realize, as soon as I walk into the office, I realize, oh God, I know more than anybody else up here. And I hadn't even started my career with Come On Gay. I'm only in the air a year or two. That if you realize it, that half of the Come On Gay uh, guys wound up teaching. That's where, how, where our training comes from. At some point, so we were trained so well that we didn't have to go to the graduate school. We had, oh, I got graduate school on there. I know that one. That I swear I was able to teach at all these different locations in New York City because of the training that the, fund, the federal, pro, federal programs put down for us to be able to train, do the on the job training. Cause that's what it was for me. Mm -hmm. You know, I went to every photographer in Kamoenge house to learn how to print. I, no, Sean, uh, I'm glad that you mentioned the funding piece in, 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 in part because I was recently doing some research on Jay Gerald and Afrocobra, the collective mm. in Chicago, which got me to thinking about um, the role that Black artist collectives have played for Black women. You know, um, you all have shared your, your stories and your experiences. And on the panel with us tonight, um, Ming Smith is, well, Ming Smith is not on the panel with us tonight, I, I should say, but she was the first woman to join Kamoenge. So I'm wondering from your perspectives, uh, why you think that collectives such as Kamoenge and Afrocobra were particularly important for black women um, who of course were experiencing the interlocking or intersectional impact of race and gender um, and often found it difficult to break into professional photography. So what kind of community do you believe that Kamoenge offered Ming Smith and other women? Tony? Oh, well, <laughs> that's a long story. <laughs> 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 and uh, to me, it doesn't matter. But some people feel that um, your personal life shouldn't be involved in these kind of things. I don't care. Um, Ming was with me for those years when she got in, so she went around with me photographing everywhere, and they saw her work, and Lou decided that he would, because I didn't want to initiate it, that she should join Kamongi. That's how that started. There was no other women before then. 
Uh, then it took a while after that, um, in the um, 2000s, I think, when the first other women came in. But it was not something that we, Kamangi did on purpose. Um, we just didn't meet anybody that qualified at that time before then. Um, and besides, I got there in 63 and was in the Navy in 65 and didn't get out till 68. Okay, there's a lot of qualified um, female photographers, but it was just that kind of thing that happened to being there at the right time. That's how it happened. Well, you know, Tony, uh, I, I think that's interesting too, but there's another aspect to Kamongi, which was, and I, I think it ties into the educational part, is that Kamongi as an institution that mentored. You know, and part of that was Lou Draper. One of the Rue saw in Ming some talent and thought that she should be mentored. Yeah, yeah. And so yeah. he decided to I decide said to that, do it. yeah, because yeah, I no. was not about to say that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I didn't want to say that. You know, it's like me pushing, you know, you, you should... No, it was Lou Draper. Um, Let me say something to you. That Ming was there with us. That we were meeting at uh, Tony's studio. And yeah. so it was Sunday that we were meeting at Tony's studio. Ming was there. So at some points, we got a chance to see her work. That was another yeah. part of it. That so yeah. you know when we saw her work, that's why she was invited. Hey, you, you look as good as what we're doing here, and she was invited. That we saw her talent, and she was invited to be the first female member. So as far as we were concerned, she was another one of the guys that could shoot well. You know, it's funny now because yeah. we, we, this, this exhibit is dealing with some of the early members, but half of the new members are all women. You know, so it was really interesting about that. And incredible photographers too, like. Um, Delphine Fawundu, you know, I mean, just incredible artists who, who are working all the time to uh, uh, both uh, um, professionally and artistically. But but I thought it was really interesting, Sean, because you were talking about teaching. And I told you I had all this academic training. I was trained by Ralph Hattersley at Columbia and by uh, Lisette Modell at the New School and, and Paul Caponegro, you know, and the best teaching I've ever seen was when I went to visit uh, Lou, uh, Lou Draper and uh, Ray Francis teaching in Brooklyn. Yeah. You know, it was the most complete photographic teaching I've ever mm -hmm. seen. So it's, I understand that same, we had the same quality in terms of uh, we had for visualizing, we had for teaching, for educating. It was the same standard. And then- Yeah, but the what is, what is the, but Danny, what mm -hmm. is the difference between you um, learning from the others and Lou Draper? It is that we are doing us. Right, but also- And they weren't doing us. I know, but it's so it was to the a student. trust and a feeling. Yeah, it was a commitment well, the to commitment the student, too, Tony. To the student. They cared about the well, student. Well, I think it's more than out. just that, Danny. I think it's more than just that. The no, no, commitment I mean, is let me, that. No, let, was, me, let me finish what I'm saying. Uh, the, the commitment in the sense that you're not going to let them go out of the class not able to shoot. The same kind yeah. of extreme criteria we had in our meetings that he had when they taught. You might be a student, you might be 19 year old, old learning photography, but you're gonna learn it right. You're not gonna just say, I'm a photographer. You're gonna be able to print. You're gonna be able to take photographs. It's not you're not just because you're in the class, but because someone had a commitment to you having some kind of excellence in your work. That's what I meant when a commitment. Well, what I wanted to know is what did you think was the difference between Hattersley and them and uh, Ray and, and Lou? But let me just break in here just for one second and say, um, we would love to encourage you all to throw some questions in the chat that we could pose to the photographers. We've got some great discussion going here about mentorship, education, um, funding, Harlem everywhere, gender politics. So we want to have you all participate in rhythm, <laughs> rhythm, body, how they move. Yeah. <laughs> so we want to have you throw your your questions into the chat so that we can pose them. To okay. <laughs> legends, and also just just to kind of wrap up the conversation about um, the women in the organization. I love Danny hearing you say that now half of the members are women. You know, so. Mean Smith was this pioneer and you know I'm so glad that she is getting all of her flowers now. Um, I first encountered her work when I was a graduate student and uh, have been just in awe of her ever since. So I'm glad that even even if it wasn't in the original plan, I'm, I, I love hearing that, that members of the 
organization saw something in her work and that that shifted the the politi the gender politics of of the organization so before we open it up for um for questions from the audience i i have another question or two if i may for you all and one of those is that we're talking about Harlem, but as you all have mentioned just so powerfully that Harlem is everywhere in a sense, right? So I'm wondering, even though a lot of the images we're showing here are images that were uh, photographed in Harlem, if you could tell us a little bit about some of your uh, favorite or most memorable experiences shooting outside of Harlem and how you took everything that you learned from that workshop space with you as you photographed in other locales? I think from my experience, it was when I went to Guyana. I, I left New York, uh, very interesting. I think that I was suffering from white people's disease. Uh, <laughs> I thought, you know, I thought I had, you know, that you, when you have know, all this intellectual stuff about all these painters and they reached the point where there was no more juice and I couldn't find an image and I'm going through this kind of stuff. And I said, well, you know, maybe I might not take pictures anymore. So I'm going through this what was me shirt. And I went to Guyana, bunch of other Kamoinga members there. I think it was one of my best portfolios. I think it was seeing different people that you know, first dark skinned people, black folks for the major part, but people that weren't starving because I remember the, they used to fuss about where I was staying that the mangoes would fall into the window and people with the housekeeper saying, I got to clean up these mangoes. Why don't somebody eat these things? And it was like, hey, I'm coming from a different place where you see people going through garbage fields. So for me, it was a different head trip, but it, it, secured and it was nothing important that Ray Francis had looked through some old German book on chemical formulas and he found a book, a formula called Stockless. I don't know if anybody ever remembers it, but he had this formula called Stockless and I used it down in Guyana to have my film developed when I came in. And it would read something like four or five tones. So and so when you, when you go into those countries, any Latin American, Africa, any of those countries, there's no light in the strip in the store. So when you're shooting in the sun, everything inside goes black. Well, this film could let you read right inside, read the faces, read the... So for me, that was Kamonga, even more so than Cuba, but Kamonga, I mean, Guyana was my place. And I'll still tell people, I think it's one of my best portfolios. I loved your Cuban work, though, Sean. Oh, thank you. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, that too. Uh, my experience was that um, when I had to go to Africa for the first time in 72, and <clears throat> as a matter of fact, Ming Smith was the model, and we went there for Tuesday Magazine. But I got so excited, and we were looking for different locations and I walked, we walked across this footbridge. It was about, I would say a half a mile footbridge. We came to this little island called Fadus. And everywhere I went, um, it was like welcome. Uh, Nobody ran from the cameras. I photographed them. Um, I tend to think now that lots of times, if you're not imposing, just by being there, they feel you, you feel them. And you can go through photographing because I had the same experiences when I was in Brazil as well and other countries. It's your presence, but it's also how you carry yourself, um, not trying to impose too much. So I walked through the whole island and I came across like a little marketplace. If you look at that photograph, if you bring it up again, no one was paying attention to me when I was photographing, but there's a little girl who's peeking behind one of the women. 
Um, it's very hard to see. I didn't even notice it until I got back home. But there were no men around at all in the whole island. They were all out fishing. But it was the most beautiful, pleasant, and rewarding thing I've ever met in my first trip abroad. It was like um, every, it was a community that everybody took care of everybody else. Um, you just got a whole feeling from walking around. And like Sean said, nobody was digging in the garbage or anything. Um, <clears throat> their homes were with shelves in it, with the, like on the outside. <clears throat> but everybody, it was like I was quietly I dreaming when I was there, and I always bring that title up. I feel that when I'm in the realm of photographing, my terminology is called I dreaming because I get into a flow and a trance and I move with a rhythm <laughs> and a feeling of what I see. So that was the most rewarding experience I had in the beginning. I love it. What about you, Danny? Well, you know, but I, I think something really interesting, when, when Sean was talking, he's talking about Harlem, but also what is Harlem? First of all, Harlem is an international place. You know, so um, in Harlem, growing up in Harlem, at least growing up in Newark and Harlem is the same thing. We grew up with music, but it was so-called Latin music or Spanish music. We're talking about mambo and, and song. So it's Afro-Cuban music, but also growing up with Alatunji being dominant, with, with jazz being dominant. You know, so once you're really comfortable in your specific location, you're comfortable anywhere you go in the world. So I think mm -hmm. when we did the, the other program for um, the Virginia Museum, Tobias Wolford, he put together a program where he showed the work of Kamonga members uh, all in Africa or, or outside of Africa. So it was Africa and Brazil and Cuba, but all the world work we'd worked outside of uh, Harlem. So again, I think it's our grounding in places like Harlem that made us feel comfortable wherever we went. But we're also following the African diaspora. We're following where African people went, where African cultures went. And we're just celebrating that wherever we went. So I mean, when you see the work, because I've done a lot of work in Brazil, when you see that work, it's the same to me as the work done in Harlem, the work done in Newark, the work done anywhere in the United States, because we're just following the culture. And it's basically African culture in the Americas. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, just hearing about the connectivity of African diasporic people through your lens, through this practice of eye dreaming, as you call it, Anthony. Oh, um, I love that. that. Thank you for that. So we're going to transition um, into our question and answer portion of the program. We now have, as you all can see, we have several questions in the chat now. So I'm going to read these questions and then, you know, you all can respond, respond because of time. I'd ask that uh, we keep the responses rather brief um, so that we can respond to as many questions as possible. So maybe if the question particularly moves you, you can respond to it and then there'll be other ones for other folks on the panel to respond to. So this first question says, can you speak about the relationship that De Carava had in the early years and how it impacted you when he left or did he stay connected to you all? Sean? All right, first of all, let me say that Roy was a major influence on me. I was one of the, other than Tony, I was the youngest guy I think came into Kamoin Gay. And Roy came to a meeting and he said that you guys are doing art. Right. I never forgot that. I mean, it, it struck me. And that was the credo that I used from that point on. I'm trying to create art. I want to create some good art. And here's Langston Hughes and Roy De Carava, and I'm, I'm, hey, I'm affiliated with these people. Then you know I'm going to try my best. And I indulged myself in every exhibition. So we went to every exhibition somebody told you to go to. You read every book. I remember Asia Cowens gave me a book called The Film Fall. No, it was a, Kim Thoughts, I think the name was. I don't know who the director was. I had to get a catharsis and a whole bunch of other stuff to try to figure out what this meant. So I took the book back to Aji. He said, what did you think about it? I said, Aji, I didn't understand it, but the writing was beautiful. He said, well, that was what the book was about. 
So that's, I mean, so I, I, Kamonge was a, the so bone for me. So it was like, hey man, you going, I'm a Rhodes Scholar. And hey, where's you, where did you go? Kamonge, that's where I went to do my Rhodes Scholar thing. I went to Sabon, I went to Kamonge. And, and that's why I mentioned earlier that half of the guys in Kamonge taught. So we didn't have to go to school to get degrees to teach. We came from Kamonge into teaching. All right. Yeah, so. Well, um, what I noticed about Roy was he didn't have to say much. What he was doing in each visual to me, and I remember the, the strongest thing that I got from all of this was that he was trying to show the beauty of us in each photograph, no matter whether they were like the, the group that was going like they were walking in the wind. He had this, that one photograph, one image said more than a whole photojournalistic thing on a story. Yeah. That one image had another depth of saying something beyond the visual, said something about our feelings for each other. He always put in the feeling he had for us, whether it was in a dance hall and even the lamp, I mean, the bulb in the hallway. <laughs> it's us. And this is where we live. And we are still a proud people. And we have to love each other and give back to each other. That was the most important thing to me. Yeah. I had never in my life seen that before. Of course, I was only 19, though. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, another question we've received from the chat is um, regarding this earlier point you made, I think it was Danny, I think you called it severe. I used the word rigorous, Danny, you used the word severe. Uh, so, so someone's asked, What's a piece of criticism you received from the collective members that has stayed with you? So who has the best story on, on being on criticism that they'd like to share with <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll take that because it's about Roy. I showed a photograph of a woman that lived in my building on 17th Street. She had a hump in her back. And there was two photographs, her, and there was another kid dressed in tuxedo. And I thought this is a bad picture. This kid in tuxedo, this is, but his eyes had went up and all you could see was the whites of his eyes. And Roy took those two pictures apart. And I was, wait a minute, are you, you know, I really, they were very interesting meeting, but <laughs> it took me a while because of my respect for Roy to understand where he was coming from. Cause I couldn't see it at the point. Wait a minute, she's out back. What's the problem? What is a problem? And it was that kind of thing. Yeah, but it's a stereotype for black people. It's something wrong with them or something. And I found that for me, and it was another thing. My father had just died. So Roy and I had, I had a love hate relationship with Roy. I don't know what Roy had with me other than he knew I was a pain in the ass. I mean, but other than that, and that was the deal is that in Kamanga, you could challenge these people and you were challenged, but I challenged Roy and Roy, oh, yeah. he could just look at you and just understood what was going on and just kind of calm you down and just take it down a little notch and stuff and ain't gonna be about arguing about this stuff. So I think that was something that I really began to look at my photographs more critically after those two conversations about those particular two photographs. And I learned that I had to look with a, a, a better eye, a different eye and a broader eye about how the world sees us and how we see us. Yeah, Sean, you know, that's oh, kind of important too. Yeah. Because there's, there's, a, there's a kind of particular genre of photography around black people, and I call it um, pathology porn. You yeah. know, where, where, where it's, it, people love to see, particularly uh, the kind of Euro-American uh, cultural scene, they love to see the pathology of the black community. So if you are talking about fracture, disillusion, or, you know, some kind of degeneration, it's not real hollow. And, you know, yeah. so 
is not as opposed they don't see celebratory hall they don't see something we celebrate you know but roy could be contradictory too because i, I remember when i worked on the sound i saw the jazz photograph of roy Nicaragua. you know i had to go through like 300 and almost 400 pieces of roy's of jazz photographs and then there was one piece that i wanted to show and he didn't want to show it this and it's a famous piece now it's the piece of the dancers in in, in um, um harlem the, the dancers are, are walking oh, down the hall yes you know, it's, it's incredibly like silhouetted dancers and Roy didn't want to show it because he thought it was, I mean, I think he had overinterpreted it. It had become, you know, yeah. black, people have, black people have to contort themselves into all these positions to, to, to fit into American system. I said, no, it's just beautiful graphics of how, how we move. Yeah, yeah. But finally, he, finally he consented. That's a masterpiece. Yeah, exactly. Finally, he consented to having the thing in the show. But it was, it was just like second guessing himself out of understanding the own beauty of what he was doing and, and the culture he was looking at, too. So. But it was it was only two because it was a critical eye he used, I think, Danny. Mm -hmm. I think that's yeah, it but, but it's funny though, Sean, because the thing that I got from Roy most of all was craft. Yeah. Because we we would argue about. It. I say, Roy, these photos are too damn dark. <laughs> say, but he he would say, no, there are no whites, there are no blacks. There are all these kind of shades of gray that I want to work with too. And you realize how magnificent he was at doing that, how he could place yeah. you know, the important oh. thing in the area that he wanted. And it was, it was too dark for my aesthetic, but it wasn't too dark for his aesthetic, too. Right. One of the things that so was important. In here yeah. with, one, with another question from the yeah, audience. But I want to finish this one point was I think people who talk about Roy's printing, particularly, Roy printed like a painter. He did not print like a photographer. And mm -hmm. I think that's why, yeah. and I think that's what all of us photographers had. Problems with Roy's printing, because but Roy looked at it as a painter. I said, "It's easy to tell." Yeah, he was an artist before. Yeah, yeah. yeah so he, yeah, he, was, he, he was a graphic artist too. Yeah, so yeah. he was in those tones. So I just wanted to say that out about. Mm -hmm. So, so we have another question here um, from the audience: As Harlem has changed and become gentrified also uh, since the beginning of Kamoenge, has the way you photograph in Harlem changed? <laughs> I hope it has. Yeah. <laughs> if, it hadn't, if it hadn't changed, we'd be dead. So you know, so. <laughs> well, let, like, me, let me say that mine has changed because I do video now. <laughs> mm. oh, well, no, I photograph the same way, just as a little extension of it. But um, um, the thing is, whether Harlem changes or not, um, <clears throat> it's that I'm photographing us and we don't change that much in our rhythm. We are still us. And that's what will always be us. So that's what I'm photographing. You know, no matter who else is there, um, whether other white people are there or not, I'm interested in photographing us. My attitude toward each thing might be that I include somebody else in there, but it's about us. I mean, what other way can I do it but to play the same rhythm all the time? Yeah, you know, so here, I'm glad that you mentioned this um, about us and us as a collective, uh, as a people, um, as an enduring people, because there have been a, a there are a cluster of questions that all get at this a similar um, a similar topic, and it's also something that I've been thinking about, and that is that you all have been making this beautiful music, capturing the rhythms of of people across the diaspora for decades now, and at this moment, your photography is being great embraced by the fine arts world. And many of these black photographers who've documented American life over the decades are finally receiving institutional recognition, often from the same institutions that black protesters fought to um, have desegregated in the black arts movement era. And of course, these are battles that we continue to fight to decolonize the museum space. So I'm wondering like, how do you all feel about the way your work has been taken up at this moment of your life and what kind of lasting impact do you want your work to have? Well, raise the prices. <laughs> That's what I'll do. 
After 60 years, well, you're going to have to pay more. That's how I feel about it. I'm not going to change anything else, but that's how I feel about it. I mean, it's never been painful for me when I wasn't recognized. It was just that I just liked what I was doing. I just loved it, and I had a passion for it. So whether anybody else recognized it or not, I really didn't care. I'm going to do what I feel. That's all. So now that you all want to pay attention, I raise the prices. That's it. Well, I think that at some point, and this is very key, because Tony said something very important, that Kamangi, all of us in Kamangi had never thought about fame. We never no. thought about being recognized. We thought about trying to do images of black folks that we wanted to see published, try to get them published somewhere and not satisfied us, it satisfied our souls. It was like out there saying, hey, Salvation Army is somebody. Hey, this is what I'm doing. If it's person by person, I can change their minds about how we look as a people, then that's what I want to do. So if I don't ever get recognized, I tell people, man, the most important thing that I've been able to do is live a life that I could call myself an artist. Do you know how incredible oh. that is for a black man yeah. in this country to be able to say, yeah, I'm an artist. <clears throat> and I've learned to uh, made a living out of it. You understand? Yeah, but uh, Sean, remember the one thing when we used to put up the work in the group, we were more happy about what we'd done when one of the members really loved it. Sure. Oh, that was, that, was, we were, that was our biggest reward was that one of the members really said they love it. Yeah. I was shooting for us. I was shooting for the members to appreciate and it helped me to go further if they really saw that I was learning something. Yeah, that was important. Yeah, I just like, I didn't you know, care about what the other people thought. Yeah, I'd like to say something about one of your sponsors that for all the years that we've been Gone, at least I have gone to Aperture, and I know everybody, some other people that went to Aperture, that they have not recognized us as a group, that maybe this, this, this thing that they've done here tonight may have been recognized us as a group of really important 20th century photographers, but they've never done a book on us. They've never done a magazine or article on us. So, you know, so they need to keep in step. So, you know, it's more difficult to, to manage to do these things when even local newspapers and books and stuff like that. And went to, went to app, just sat down and said, they, oh, they, they had never else to say, but they'd never heard of us. How in the hell are you the most important magazine in the world? And you could say that you had never heard of a group of black photographers that have been around for 50 years? What hole have you been, you had your head in? So I, you know, I don't mean to say anything wrong, but I just, every time I see their name, they kind of give me the shiver sometimes. Okay, it's in my little piece. Danny, do you have any closing thoughts? Uh, I, I guess I do have quite a few closing thoughts, but it's, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, no, no, because it's really funny though. Because I think if, if, if someone deigns to do a book on, on uh, Kamoyenge, a new book, I think they should include all the members. There are 20-something members, 24 members in Kamoyenge, too. I think it would be nice to have them represented. Because I think it's not, I mean, I know logistically it was a problem to try and do all of them for this show. But uh, it's unfair to all the members who are equally talented as the, as the older members to not have some represent, uh, re representation of their work in any suggestion of, of Kamoyenge, any talk of Kamoyenge. Well, at that time when Timeless was done, we I put everybody in the book. You, you, you yeah. did. You did that. I yeah. agree. Now they want more members. Okay, fine. It's going to be a bigger book. Good. I hope so. I hope so. It's yeah. going to be an appropriate book, not a bigger, an appropriate book. Well, it's going to be bigger then. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, I, I, I will go on record having said that, you know, if and when Aperture writes something on the collective, I'd be happy to contribute. I, I've learned so much about, so much more about African-American history um, than I even learned in grad school by 
working in close proximity to black artists and intellectuals and thinkers and uh, the interviews I've been able to to conduct with folks of your generation have just been groundbreaking for me in terms of the ways that it's opened up the histories and the kinds of stories that we're able to tell. And so it's also why I truly believe that, you know, we should be celebrating so many of our elders while they're still here, while they're still here to tell the story through their own perspective, through their own voice. And so it's really been a pleasure to be in conversation with you all to hear those stories and also to have a little bit of improv <laughs> to make music with you all oh. to, to move even through the zoom i wish we could have done this event in person but you know covid well, I, per I personally like zoom i like the fact <laughs> that zoom can you like the zoom back no i no, no i like because we can reach an international audience right now yeah. you know yeah. you know cuz we're i yes. dreaming we're i dreaming That's <laughs> right and, and some might be asleep, but we, we can reach a lot of people right now through Zoom. Well, yeah. I want to just, you know, thank you all for your time this evening. I want to thank the audience for uh, th their engaged questions in, in the chat box. We're going to copy that chat so we can make sure we give the questions to the panelists so that they can uh, see the other things that we didn't necessarily get to, but the kinds of questions and, and feedback that you all had. Um, at this time, I'd like to thank again the staff of the Whitney Museum for coordinating this event. I'd also like to thank um, the Aperture for inviting me to moderate this event. It's truly been a pleasure for reasons both personally and professionally. And I also want to remind members of the audience that this is one of several events with members of the Kamoinga Collective um, that again are centered on the exhibition up at the Whitney working together. And so you can visit the Whitney website to find more information about the future events. Um, and yeah, I guess that's a perfect place to close just by saying <laughs> many of you might not be able to make the, to, the exhibition in person, but if you are able to do so safely and responsibly, I hope you do. I had an opportunity to see it and it really is mind blowing. The kind of eye dreaming you can do in that space is- mm -hmm. Walk with a rhythm and through the gallery. <laughs> <laughs> so have a great evening everyone. Peace and love, see you all. Okay. Thank you, thank, thank you. you Tanisha. Thank you. Thank you, Tanisha. Tanisha, are you still on the line? Yes, I'm still here. Could you do me a favor? Could you send me your phone number? I want to talk to you. Yes, for sure. He wants to okay. date. Okay. And Danny. <laughs> uh -huh. Danny. Danny, this is John. You got to come pick up your t shirts. All right. Okay. <coughs> I got it. All right. All right. Later. <laughs>